Hello, and thank you for joining our introduction to Design Thinking webinar series. My name is Keith Keating, and I'm a Design Thinking Practitioner with GP Strategies. In this eight-part webinar series, we will be sharing the theory of design thinking from a high-level overview through each of the five phases and finishing with suggestions for ways that you can continue learning on your journey to becoming a design thinking practitioner. In this session, I will be sharing with you an overview of the first phase in the design thinking methodology, empathy. Before we start with empathy, as a quick reminder, design thinking is comprised of five phases. We start first with empathy, where we learn about our audience. We then move into define, where we're defining the problem statements based off of what we've learned from our audience during the empathy phase. And then of course we move into the ideation phase where we brainstorm and we create solutions based off of the problem statements that we've defined. And then of course we move into the prototype phase where we create quick prototypes of one or more representations of the ideas. And then we move into the test phase where we test our ideas and we gain user feedback. In the first phase of design thinking, we learn about the audience in the empathy phase. And empathy is defined as the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from within their frame of reference. Simply put, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Empathy helps us uncover the voice of the customer and also remove our own bias. You see, we carry our own experiences and understandings. Our unique perspective is an incredibly valuable asset but at the same time, it carries assumptions and personal beliefs. These preconceived notions may be misconceptions or stereotypes, and they can limit the amount of real empathy that we can build. And so practicing empathy and conducting empathy research really helps us break through by listening to our customers, really listening. And it sounds simple, but our customers are not always in the forefront of everything that we do. And when we're listening, truly listening, we can absorb what users say and how they say it. And empathy is at the heart and it's the foundation of design thinking, occurring constantly, not just in phase one, but always reframing our thoughts and our patterns back to our entire purpose, which is our customers. Now, by nature, when we speak with others, we're typically looking to confirm what it is that we already know. This is called confirmation bias, and this is part of our human nature. Human nature is already working against empathy. When we're focusing on that confirmation, it leads us to hear and to interact through a filter, also known as bias. And if you think that the problem is a system or a tool, you're likely to take that first response that sounds like this is what I already think. And so let's settle in on that idea. So we'll teach you today how to use unpacking questions and the concept of storytelling to make sure that you're truly empathizing with your users and understanding the situation from their perspective. Additionally, we don't just hear what we want. We actually believe that most people hold the same beliefs as we do. And that's called false consensus effect. In research, it's uncommon that the majority of people do see any issue the exact same way that we do. And so again, this can impact the way that we hear responses from others. And when there are answers that they're giving that aren't really clear, or maybe there's a pause in the conversation, we tend to fill that in with our own assumption. So we need to be very cognizant and aware of confirmation bias, but also false consensus effect. When we're conducting empathy research in design thinking, there are tends, tends to be three approaches that we follow. Immersion, observation, and engagement. Now, in the immersion phase, this is where you immerse yourself in the experience that your users experience, wearing their hats, trying on, doing what they're actually doing. Find ways to immerse yourself in those specific environments to understand firsthand who you're designing for, who the problem is for, walk in their shoes or wear their hats. The second is observing how users interact with their environment or each other or the products. When you're observing, you're like a fly on the wall. 
in that unintrusive environment, you want to capture quotes, behaviors, and any other notes that might reflect their experience. Typically, this is done at a distance, not interrupting their environment. Watching users helps to give us clues as to what they might think and feel, and maybe what they even need, and why the issues are occurring. And lastly, ask, engage, talk to them, engage directly with the users, interact with them and interview them, but make sure that it's in a comfortable environment on their turf. Engaging users reveals deeper insights into their beliefs and values. It also helps to make a connection between what you observe, people say they do, but then what they actually do. Engaging your users and conducting empathy research takes a bit of preparation to make sure that the experience is a success on both sides. It's not as simple as just going out and starting to have discussions with people. You want to make sure that you're properly prepared. So there are a couple of techniques that you need to follow in order to prepare. The first is you want to assume a beginner's mindset. Yes, we all have the preconceived notions. We may have ideas about what the problem is, about what the solution is. But during empathy research, our goal is to have our mind be a blank slate. It's a white piece of paper. We are starting fresh with the discussions so that we can truly understand from our user's perspective. We're not there to judge on the situation at hand, on what it is that they're telling us. We are there simply to listen question everything that they're telling us. Even when you assume you know the answer or you know the reason what is happening or why they're giving their answer they're giving, question more. Be truly curious. Our participants know when we actually care, when we're engaged, or when we're just there to perform a duty of asking questions. Find patterns in the responses that they're giving and listen, really listen. Now, in order to prepare for the research, for the interview research, there's a couple of best practices. First is to brainstorm your questions. Don't just come up with a list and go out and start asking them. Have input from other individuals on your team to brainstorm a general list of questions that you want to ask. And then once you have that list, Identify and order themes within your questions so that it has a coherent flow when you're conducting your empathy research. Refine the questions. A best practice is once you have your initial list, once you've got them th in a thematic order, go out and actually conduct a dry run of the interview to make sure that the words and the vocabulary become your own so that you're comfortable with what you're asking rather than it being a cold 2020 style interview, it needs to be a discussion and you need to make sure that you're comfortable with those questions. So make sure that you refine the questions. And then of course, create an interview protocol because most often you will not be the only person going out and conducting interviews. You're going to have a team of individuals and you wanna make sure that everybody has the same approach to the questions that's, that are being asked. You may not ask them word for word, but you want to have a similar flow in how you're opening the empathy research discussion to the questions to how you're closing the empathy research. So these are four best practices for preparing for the interview. Now, during the actual interview, there are a number of best practices that we want to share with you today. First of all, you are there to listen. So a good ratio is 90% listening, 10% asking. And that's asking in the sense of asking questions, not responding, not giving your own thoughts, your own feedback, not solutioning, but simply asking more questions to get more information from our research. 90% listening, 10% asking. Remember that you are there to valid, excuse me, to understand, not to validate. You are there to understand from their perspective, not to validate any thoughts or beliefs that you may have had bringing into the situation based on your experience, based on what you've been told previously, you're there to understand. Encourage stories and follow tangents. If they're going 
off script of what you're asking and they want to open a door and go down a different path, go down that path with them. Your job is to gather as much information about the individuals as possible. Take copious amounts of notes because these notes are going to be valuable, valuable tools for you, not just for this research, but maybe even in the future. Pay attention to nonverbal cues. When your research participants start to shut down, or they're not interested, or they're not maintaining eye contact, or they're, you're finding that a question is making them uncomfortable, pivot, move on. Don't force them. Those nonverbal cues are going to be imperative to make sure that you've got a connection with your interview. Don't be afraid of silence. Let them have time to think about the question, to think about the answer, and respond. If they don't understand the question, they may ask you to repeat it in a different way, but otherwise embrace that silence and let them have that time to come up with a answer to the question. Ask questions neutrally and don't suggest answers. And lastly, use open and unpacking questions. You want to avoid yes, no questions because that closes the door as quickly as it opens it. If you give someone the opportunity to answer with a yes or no, that's all you're going to get is a yes or a no. We want to hear from their words, their vocabulary. So you've got to use open and unpacking questions. So some examples of those, when you ask the first question, their response is not enough. That's only going to be the surface. You want to drill down and you want to uncover what's the root of that answer that they're giving. How can you elicit more information from them with that single question? And the answer is using unpacking questions like, why do you say that? Or why? Tell me more about that. What were you thinking when you did that? Can you walk me through what led you to that decision? How did you feel about that? What did you think about that? So best practice is the first response that they give you to an answer is never the end of the story. It's just the beginning. You want to use unpacking questions to get to the real heart, root cause, what they're actually trying to tell you in that story. In terms of the mechanics of empathy research, a couple of best practices to be aware of. An empathy research is not a focus group. We recommend that you only have a single interviewer, a single participant that you're focusing on. We also recommend that there be a interviewer, maybe yourself, but then also someone who's there with you to take notes. So that way you can truly be focused on making a connection with that individual, truly listening to them, rather than worrying about writing down or typing up everything that they're trying to say to stop them from speaking, but you can remain truly engaged with them. So have a note taker. It's also recommended in terms of the note taker and the interviewer to not have two males, but to have either two females or to have a male and a female as the note taker and the interviewer. We also recommend that whenever possible, conduct empathy research in person. We understand that that may not always be possible. So a second option could be using Skype or video conferencing or any type of technology tool where you can see the person that you're talking with, that you're trying to understand so that you can make that connection with them and also be able to see parts of their body language, even virtually. But the best practice is always in person where it's available. And then of course, have open ending, non-leading and probing questions so that you continue helping to unpack what it is that they're trying to say to you or to share with you in terms of the responses to the research questions. And lastly, the anatomy of an interview. It's recommended as a best practice, the interview not last longer than 45 minutes. So typically I will block a one hour time frame. And 45 minutes will be for the interview and 15 minutes will be for a debrief between myself and the note taker and sharing what we thought, what we felt, what we experienced, making sure that we were aligned in that area. So the, for the anatomy of the interview, we tend to start with, of course, introducing yourself and the project, building up a bit of rapport, not just jumping right into the questions, but talking about maybe some topical questions. How was their day? What's going on? Just something to get to know them 
sharing a little bit of information about yourself, building that rapport, and then moving into the questions that you're wanting to ask and evoking stories from them. Explore the emotions that you're feeling, seeing, or hearing. And then, of course, wrapping up with any follow-up questions, uh, making sure that you've confirmed any thoughts or beliefs that you might have had based on what they've said, giving them an opportunity to share any other information that may not be a part of your question. Typically, the last question that I'll ask is, is there anything else you'd like to share with me today about any thoughts that might have come up about any of the questions we've asked or anything else in general that you just feel might be helpful? And then, of course, wrapping up with a thank you. And so again, recommendation is that this lasts about 45 minutes and then you give yourself 15 minutes for a wrap up. We also recommend that before conducting any empathy research, you make sure that you've reached out to their managers so that the managers are aware of the fact that you'll be coming in or you'll be talking to their employees. You can even share your questions with their managers because it's important that we get that leadership, that management buy-in and support so that those individuals can have time away from work, but also that the managers aren't concerned about you coming in and talking to their workforce. We also recommend that managers do not be included in the interview sessions. And sometimes a manager may walk in and you might have to pivot the questions that you're asking so that you don't make uh, the interviewee uncomfortable because their manager is there. But again, it's recommended that it just be that individual person in the room. So this concludes our session today on empathy. Make sure to check out our next session on the Define phase. So thank you for joining us, and we look forward to sharing with you more ideas and best practices. And don't forget to check out the rest of the Design Thinking website. And make sure to use the contact form to reach out to us, or simply add me on LinkedIn to continue this discussion. Thank you for joining.